important business to transact here today. Is uh, Professor Sweeney here with us? <laughs> okay, uh, we'll stand by. Uh, uh, we'll proceed. Uh, so I was out, um, my name is Zach Tuman. I, uh, I'm on the research staff at the Belfer Center in the program in science, technology, and public policy. Um, we've been long interested in geospatial. We're pleased to co-sponsor uh, our sessions here today with the Center for Geographic Analysis and Berkman. Um, uh, I was standing in the lobby and looking at these marvelous graphics and admiring their beauty. And I, uh, as I squinted my eyes to start to unravel the mysteries of many, I was reminded of the tale told uh, by a, 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 a senior executive in government who had just uh, uh, come from a new network operations center where he said there were 60 brand new plasma screens, all with beautiful displays, all revealing a different part of the world and a different truth. And he was so overwhelmed and frazzled by what he saw that he swiveled in his captain's chair to his number two on his right and said, so what do you think we should do next? The information was hard to adjust to, hard to grab, um, it was hard to convert, and that is the, uh, uh, the challenge, I think, that we're here to talk about today, which is uh, context is everything, um, uh, uh, the data is all around, converting it to outcomes of value is critical. How then should we do that? Uh, and folks have been thinking hard about this stuff for a long time. Um, some of them are here on our panel. Some of them, uh, some on our panel today um, uh, are, are leading some important initiatives that can give us even more insight to that. And I'd like to introduce them quickly so that we can get to uh, our business. Um, uh, Chris Tucker to my left is the president of Yale House Venture. Uh, Chris, uh, although you can read his bio, uh, I'll just tell you he has, he has been at the heart of um, uh, moving technology uh, front and center into, uh, into commerce, into business, into government uh, in incredibly important ways, uh, uh, and he's a valued uh, colleague. Um, uh, Bernd uh, uh, Resch is research director uh, at the University of Heidelberg. He's got three other titles. I'll name them quickly. Research affiliate at the MIT Sensible City Lab. Visiting fellow at Harvard University, which is a big place. Where at Harvard are you a fellow? At CGA. Uh, at CGA, wonderful, congratulations. And lecturer at the University of Salzburg in Austria. Raj Singh uh, serves as the director of interoperability programs for Open Geospatial Consortium, um, uh, one of our most important uh, industry associations. Um, uh, Jerry Meckling is uh, on, the, on the end, is research vice president at Gartner, but uh, for those of you who don't know Jerry, um, Jerry, for 20 years, I won't even say that's more, but uh, for, for, um, uh, yeah, for 30 years uh, at Harvard Kennedy School, developed uh, programs in technology and computing um, that gave senior executives in government their first taste at the issues of strategic management of technology. Um, he is adored, revered, and renowned um, as a uh, as a former fac past faculty member uh, uh, of the School of Government, and we're delighted to have him. He's also been my boss twice. Um, and uh, we are joined as well by, 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 I'll get it soon, Matt Gentile. Yeah. Greetings. Uh, who's head of geospatial practice uh, and principal at Deloitte, financial advisory services. Welcome. Um, I know the order I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with. I'm gonna end with Jerry. So Jerry's gonna back clean up. Um, May we start with you, Chris? We'll start with Chris, sure. um, and then we'll go down the go down the row. Chris, Chris Tucker, thanks. Sure. Okay. Um, someone here somewhere. I was here. I heard the previous <coughs> session. I said, "Oh, that's the wrong talk." So I went back and grabbed another talk. <laughs> Greetings. <laughs> Welcome. Nice to be back. Nice to be Great. All uh, set then? Uh, ten minutes, something like that? Yeah. All right. Less. All right, so I'll go fast. Spatial data infrastructures, um, uh, I'll, I'll talk a bit about. Um, it's kind of a term of art. Who's, who uses that term on a fairly frequent basis? Who doesn't use that term on a fairly, fairly frequent basis? M most of you, right. So, um, and here's our panel guidance, just in, in case you were wondering. So I, I always like to talk, I, I like history. I like history lessons. And spatial data infrastructure, while it's a fairly recent term of art, and it's actually in 
OMB circulars that I'll talk about and executive orders and things like that in the United States, and it's kind of term of art adopted rather globally. I always like to kind of go back and say it's, it's nothing new. Um, so uh, I, I like to talk uh, a term that my friend created called Napoleonic know-how. And he focuses on, you know, yes, Napoleon was a great battle commander, and that's what he's famous for, but the thing he's most proud of uh, was uh, his code, the Napoleonic Code, in particular the cadaster. Um, and really, uh, uh, he and my friend coined the term Napoleonic know-how as, you know, all of the different things that um, uh, our governments are capable of doing because certain things are mapped. Uh, in particular, uh, administrative boundaries, uh, uh, governance structures, census, cadaster. Um, and, and census and cadaster are, are really, really important things. This goes uh, a long way back. And Napoleon made sure that all of Europe under his dominion was mapped down to the individual parcel. That uh, was held down at town hall. Everybody knew what the ownership was. It had an address. You had an ID. You could no longer call yourself Lawrence the Great. You became Lawrence de Gross. You had an address. It was tied to the parcel. And if you tried to move around in the labor market, uh, the French government could stop you. Uh, so that may sound like really oppressive and totalitarian, but you can also uh, look at any well-developed uh, society on Earth today has all of those basic administrative um, uh, records available that are inherently geospatial. Um, you can't have representative uh, democracy without a census, right? That's actually core to our constitution. Um, uh, and so you can actually reapportion, you know, representative democracy over time, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, it's not just a French thing. We had this guy named George Washington. Um, his profession was actually surveying, right? Uh, so a, a lot of the East Coast of the United States was surveyed by George Washington. Um, he was given that charter by the governor of Virginia. Um, uh, and, and so it's, it's really kind of central to how America uh, from very early on uh, thought about itself. But also we have these guys, Lewis and Clark, right, that were sent across this big, vast, open, um, mysterious nothingness. Uh, because we didn't know what was out there. We didn't know what resources were out there. We didn't know who the people were. You know, we heard rumors from the French and stuff like that. But um, before we even had manifest destiny as a concept, right, we had to go figure out what the hell is out there to the West. So mapping has really been core to the United States. Uh, it, it, I, and I would suggest that kind of in the 1700s, you know, when we actually understood that the Earth was round and, you know, we got the skills, whether on a celestial basis or whatever, to actually map, um, a lot of these things, you know, clicked with a lot of our other political uh, philosophy concepts, et cetera. So I think mapping is pretty key. So spatial data infrastructure, um, as a term of art, uh, has to be understand, uh, understood as a fairly recent thing, right? So Executive Order 12906 in 1994 was signed out by President Clinton specifically to coordinate geographic data. It's not like this was the first time. We actually had a mapping office in the Bureau of the Budget in the White House for a very long, you know, starting in the 1930s. So mapping was key in the 1930s, but, you know, things started getting digital. We started having Landsat satellites on these things, and they realized they didn't have adequate organization of this in the public sphere, so they had an executive order to do this. OMB Circular came along later to actually refine it, to set up the governance structure, et cetera. And more than that, we actually started Johnny Appleseeding the concept of spatial data infrastructure around the world by sponsoring the Global Spatial Data Infrastructure Secretariat uh, out of Reston, Virginia, inside the U.S. Geological Survey. So these are, you know, pretty uh, central, you know, concepts that while pretty much nobody in Washington would be able to recite any of this stuff. You know, it's actually ingrained in the administrivia of, of how our countries run. Um, and kind of, I think, some concrete examples are interesting, right? So we have, it manifests itself in different ways. One is the national map, where the U.S. Geological Survey actually has the director of national geospatial programs. They run the national map. They collate and, and uh, collect and put together all this information about the U.S. Uh, they have core data sets that are actually tied back to 12906 in terms of what the government should be collecting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's all free to the world. That's how the U.S. rolls, right? Collect all the stuff on uh, public taxpayer money and then hand it out for free. HSIP Gold, uh, Homeland Security Infrastructure Protection Database, something that NGA created in the wake of 9-11 was actually different, right? Because they said, national map doesn't cut the mustard. Uh, it doesn't cut the mustard for the purposes of homeland security. It doesn't give us all the information that we need. We need to go get that other information. 
So they licensed commercial data that was out there. They didn't necessarily make it available to all the US citizens because it was used for security purposes, et cetera, et cetera. So we actually have another spatial data infrastructure. You don't need to think of it as like the secret police state data infrastructure because most of it is literally commercially licensed. It's the same data that successful businesses license to be able to navigate the US uh, successfully, but that was not data collected by the US government for the purposes of US government citizenry. So they licensed that sort of stuff. Think of it as like Navtech data, the same stuff in Google Maps. Think of it as the uh, MCH information on every hospital, every nursing home, etc. Because when Katrina comes, you need to know where all the nursing homes are because those people are immobile and they need to be, um, you know, rescued. Um, so you can, talk, you can think about that as a more private, even though it's a public SDI. And then OS Master Map, the Ordnance Survey, uh, for those of you who don't know, um, is the British kind of mapping agency, except for it's actually run as a uh, government-sponsored enterprise. So it actually has to make money. Um, while it started as kind of the old, literally the Ordnance Survey as the military mapping thing, um, it, they actually sell their maps. So um, that actually precipitated I'll talk about OpenStreetMap later, where at least one British citizen was kind of pissed that he pays his taxes and then has to pay for his maps. Um, not quite understanding how, you know, Ordnance Survey works. But they have some of the absolute best data because, by law, they actually have to collect every built structure within six months of its creation at survey grade. So they have little dudes in, in you know, yellow uh, vests running around all of the UK mapping that stuff. And it's pretty incredible what they've achieved. So this can manifest itself in different ways around the world. Um, one common thing around the world is the Open Geospatial Consortium because they all say, everybody says, if we're going to have an SDI, it needs to be interoperable, I need some standards, and every government can kind of create their own standard, of course, then it won't be standard. Um, uh, so one of the things that has kind of manifested out of civil society and public-private partnership is the Open Geospatial Consortium, uh, where it's standards for... Uh, web service standards for how I request that information and encoding standards for how it's encoded and passed to me and how my software can read it and use it and things like that. Um, which, you know, at a technical level, your spatial data infrastructure simply won't work unless you've got things like Open Geospatial Consortium standards. Talk a little bit about commercial SDI, uh, which frankly, in, in my definition of SDI, I find it somewhat anemic. Uh, we had a lot of things when the first time, not an app, but literally a service that I could request data from to use in my application, and I could pay by the drink. Um, some of these things are popping out. Globe Explorer was an early instance of it that got purchased by Digital Globe uh, and used as their pay by the drink. You know, I need some commercial satellite imagery in my application. Google Maps, when they opened up their APIs, right, I could just feed that into my application. AIS is, um, for those of you who ever do ship tracking, you'll know AIS. Uh, it's a commercial service to track every beacon ship on the planet. Um, and there's, there's a number of these out there, but they're fairly narrow. Um, and also, we haven't really worked out, um, maybe we've worked out some of the technical issues, but we haven't worked out how to have a blended business model of you know, public and private and closed and open, et cetera. Uh, open SDI, a few things have popped up. Um, Wikimapia, if you've seen that, is a big bucket in the sky where people can shove their observations about the world and it's available as an API. OpenStreetMap is by far the most successful one of these things. It's been around about a decade. They have over a million contributors and I would argue they have the best, is anybody with Navtech here? Right? They, they have the best street map that's out there. Um, and it's improvable by it, anybody and everybody. Um, and uh, one of my uh, little social ventures, Map Story, it's a similar thing focused more on history. Um, but there, there's actually an intellectual property regime with Creative Commons and Open Database License that is allowing people to create these big buckets in the sky where everybody can contribute what they know about the world. So there's kind of this paradigm shift between kind of a factory mentality of, of I'm going to have a public agency that's funded to create X number of map widgets over time. Um, and I have a certain defect rate that's acceptable, et cetera, et cetera, to, you know, the world's allowed to map itself. Um, and so th there's a big shift, I think, in, in our perception of what a SDI is now with all the open stuff. Um, some basic challenges, and then I'll wrap up. Uh, licensing, obviously, you know, uh, the public agencies in the U.S. say this must be um, public domain, right? It has to be public domain. The lawyers have all said it has to be public domain. OpenStreetMap says it's all got to be CCSA and ODBL, which they would argue is more open than, you know, and globally recognized than public domain, which is more of an American construct that isn't recognized globally. WTF, like how, how do we reconcile all that? 
Um, and, and it's a big, it's a big issue. Monetizing in G-commerce, right? I can have access to the Google API, but I have to pay a certain amount. How do I, how do I think through how I'm going to roll out these apps when the monetization schemes change? Liability and privacy, I defer to the pros here, um, but we've had a lot of those topics come up. Um, achieving completeness, I think, is a big thing. You know, you can fund a public agency with a finite budget to do the best it can to map X, X number of widgets with X number of defect rate. Um, or you could open it up to the world to fill in the gaps when they see the gaps. And I think there are huge issues around, you know, finite budgets and achieving completeness and which paradigm you choose. And same thing with timeliness. Um, hosting also, the cloud. The cloud's making a lot of things ridiculously easy to do. Um, and, and, you know, World Map is an example of that, you know, because Amazon EC2, you can throw it out there and go crazy. Map Story is another example of that. OpenStreetMap is another example of that. So I don't need a massive government data center uh, in order to change the world anymore. I literally swipe my credit card and, you know, cut back on my sushi budget in order to pay for it. <laughs> I mean, it's that cheap. Or my sushi budget's that big. Um, <laughs> so my, uh, this is my final slide, and I'll leave it. Um, uh, is kind of the future of SDI. I personally believe we're kind of on a big macro historical trend toward openness. Um, we've, you know, Open Geospatial Consortium has been around now for 25 years, something like that. It's got a huge head of steam, global adoption, etc. Open source, you're starting to see actual open source software implementations of the open standards. So it's literally free to download. You know, like the Open Geo stack, for instance, gets downloaded 20,000 times a month. <laughs> Right? So it's not a trivial thing, and the OGC stuff comes for free with it. Uh, open data, when the Obama administration came in, right, there was a big focus on open data, uh, open street map, all these things are part of that. And n these things are never going away. Right? Open source implementations of this stuff is done, and it's never going away. The standards are done, they're never going away. The data is out there, it's never going away. Open stack with the cloud, um, that stuff's never going away. Uh, open government, uh, open story. We'll pump for, for map story, but it gets crazier and crazier, like mobile is opening up where 10 years ago, y you know, you were a slave to whoever own, you know, owned yet that cell phone or, or gave you that cell phone. Uh, open science, you see a big movement in open science that is fundamentally op uh, using geospatial, spatial temporal information. Um, and then the internet of things, right, which is opening up into something that is kind of engulfing us all. So I think there, it, you know, the future of SDI is open, uh, but we still have to navigate all these kind of complex issues. So.